friend from the UK with me today, and his name is Freddie Jackman, and you may have heard of him or not, but we are going to be talking about the power of love. So, you know, I, you can hear it already in the background, Huey Lewis playing, and we're all going forward here. So welcome, Freddie, and uh, I'd just like you to introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about your background and just how you came to hypnosis. Well, thanks for inviting me, Ennis. Um, yeah, I'm Freddie Jack Quinn. I'm a hypnotherapist. I run the Jack Quinn Hypnosis Academy. We train people all over the world how to be hypnotherapists with my son, Anthony. Uh, we've been doing that together now for 20 years. I actually um, got into hypnosis, I imagine like a lot of people, out of curiosity. Um, you know, I was just fascinated by how it works. I've, in my younger life, I've done, uh, I've coached boxing, ABA boxing, and I've coached mini football. So I've always been interested in the, in the power of the mind when it comes to performance. And, you know, and even in my, in my previous life as a salesperson, <laughs> uh, you know, the, how to influence people with words and language, all of that interests me. So for whatever reason, I, I saw some, a, a course advertised it was called successful hypnotherapy and I had some time. So I thought I could just go and do it out of curiosity. And to be honest with you, the course wasn't very good looking back <laughs> on it, um, knowing what I know now, <laughs> but, uh, and the, it was a big emphasis on the successful, you know, how can you make a career out of hypnotherapy? Um, I wasn't interested in making a career out of hypnotherapy at the time. I just wanted to know how it works and see what, how it works. And I came back off that course and um, then my son said, oh, you know, you're a hypnotist now, are you? You know, like, you know, I've suddenly got this new skill and laughing. And he said to me, you know, I said, well, yeah, I can hypnotize. And he said, well, you can't. I said, well, look, have a go. I said, what do you want to do? And he was boxing at the time. He wanted to lose two stones for this fight. So I said, well, lay on the couch because of that. I'd, I'd trained in hypnoanalysis. You've probably heard of it, you know, the yeah. old... Freudian way of lay on a couch, tell me what you're thinking and uh, take you back for all the rubbish in your life. It's not a good way to work, uh, but it's how I, I, the first course that I did. So I laid my son on the settee. I didn't lay him, he laid down the settee. And I started doing the, you know, the relaxation kind of uh, induction. And he lay there all the way through it going, just laughing at me all the way through it, you know. But he, 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 he stayed there for the for period of time. Anyway, long story short, he then lost two stone and he never had, and the only, only tool I had was a very blunt instrument was uh, aversion. So I gave him an aversion to potatoes and um, potatoes and what else was it? Bread. And so for the next <laughs> the probably, four, probably four years, he never had any potatoes or bread after. He still doesn't believe he's been hypnotized, but he lost, <laughs> he lost two stone. And so, you know, that got me interested. And then when other people are here that you've done hypnosis, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And to be honest, I just loved it. And I still do. And I've been doing it for 30 years now. Yeah. And I still love it. I never get, I never lose the fascination for how it works. And in that 30 years, there have been people, and you'll know them, who do research into hypnosis. And they've spent 30 years trying to figure out how hypnosis works. And in that 30 years, <laughs> while they've been trying to figure out how it works or why it works, I've actually helped over 30,000 clients. Yeah. You know, and so for me, I still don't know how it works. I, you know, <laughs> I have my theory. We all to, have theories, right? Yeah, as do a million people on why it works. There are some things in life that you just have to accept are sort of natural phenomena for one of the better words. Yes. You know, it's, uh, it's a bit like electricity. You know, you can try and figure out how it works, but we, we use it. We switch on the light and we use it and we, it helps us in all kinds of different ways. And if you're really posh, you, you've probably got a car that runs on electric now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, all these things that we use that are super powerful that help us, a lot of us don't understand how it works. And as I said, there's a lot in the UK now, there's 
there's a lot of people looking into evidence-based hypnosis. Unless, unless there's evidence to prove it, I'm not going to use it. The truth of the matter is, and I, I did say this to someone who's looking at evidence-based and, you know, and, and banging on about the fact that it's got to be evidence-based. I said, the thing is that hypnosis utilizes the imagination. Do we agree on that? Sure, I would definitely agree on that. Okay, so hypnosis uses the imagination, and the imagination is created by the mind. Mm -hmm. we, do we agree on that? Yeah, we do. Well, but then the thing is, the mind only exists as a concept in our imagination. That's right, it's totally that way. And that's no one's why... ever held a mind in their head. If you ask a brain surgeon if they've got a mind, they probably say yes. And if you ask if he's got a subconscious or, or unconscious mind and a conscious mind, he'd probably go yes. If you ask him where that mind is, he'd probably tap his skull. Yeah. But the truth is, no one's ever held a mind in their hand. So right. when we're trying to figure out or trying to explain what hypnosis is, and I, say, I said to this man I was talking to, who was you know, completely on about this evidence base, I said, if Hypnosis utilizes imagination. Imagination is created by the mind, and the mind only exists as a concept in our imagination. I say, if you've got a picture of a dog just chasing its own tail, <laughs> got, that's uh, a perfect uh, analogy. But I always said, you know, the mind is infinite. So let's just keep going, and there's no evidence. I think the evidence base is that you just help 30,000 people. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, and the thing is, <laughs> is, you know this as well. You know, when a client comes to you with a problem, and we run our protocol or run our technique with them, mm -hmm. um, the the evidence, as you say, is the experience they have afterwards. Yeah. If someone comes in and they're in chronic pain and they, they not, you know, pills won't touch it anymore, and then they sit with you for a while and, and you talk to them because we only have words, don't we? You know, we don't have mm -hmm. Well, some people have a swinging watch. I've actually got one, but it's only to, fr <laughs> it's only to frighten people down at the pub. You know, uh, <laughs> I don't actually use it <laughs> in the therapy room. Um, but, you know, all we, all we have is our words. And, but the power of words is immense. And so the client that comes in, they really don't care how it works. You know, they just want relief from their pain or relief yeah. from their smoking habit or their yeah. drug problem or their fear and their phobias. You know, they don't care really how it works. No, they just um, want to come in and be, and be helped. That's they, want, they want relief from their problem. Yeah. Yeah. And the evidence is in, like the, if you like, we say the, the, uh, the proof pudding. of the pudding <laughs> <laughs> in the outcome. Yeah. And it is the same in hypnosis, That's you know. Right. Uh, yes, it, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated, but I'd love someone to say this is how it works, Freddie. You know, and they've done, they've done um, MRI scans yeah. on people's brains when they're under hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And what they say is there's two areas of the brain. This is the only thing that makes any kind of sense to me in, in the science behind it. There are two areas of the brain. I think it's called the anterior cingular gyrus, which is the area of the brain that is uh, involved in planning uh, a future um, event. Let's say you had to pick a cup up yeah. or you had to drive a car. When we engage, before we engage in doing that activity, that part of our brain lights up. So it will plan everything we need to do before we even move. Yeah. So it's, it, I think I'm pretty sure, don't, tr don't quote me on this, I'm not a scientist, no, I'm a hypnotist. Um, so, <laughs> the anterior cingular gyrus. And so when I had these people in this brain scan and they were looking at it under, you know, they could, they see this area of the brain light up. So under hypnosis, that lights up even more. And so closely linked to that is the, I think it's something to do with the, with the frontal cortex. Okay, I can't yeah. think of the name of it now, but that's the part that, that um, it's engaged with how we'll feel about a future a action. So I like to think of that as our conscience. So let's say, you know, you saw 10 pounds on the, or $10 on the side, you think about picking it up and putting it in your pocket. The next thing would be, the next part, once you think about that, 
then that other part kicks in that says, well, how are you going to feel about it? And what's the person going to feel like whose $10 yeah. it is? And then stops you from doing it. So yeah. those two parts of the brain are, are closely connected. Mm-hmm. When, but both of those are under, under kind of strain or stress when you're in hypnosis. So that is why it explains why people can get people to do strange things on stage. Because <laughs> the moment you're hypnotized, that part of your brain that plans the action is sort of suspended and you can't have a vacuum in your brain. So whatever says happens next, which it, your brain just accepts. So when the hypnotist on stage says, you know, a moment, uh, you're Elvis Presley, when the music starts, you're going to sing like Elvis Presley. Well, generally, most of us would go, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm, I don't, I'm going to make myself look stupid. But because the other area of the brain, which which figures out how you're going to feel about that action is also not hundred percent. We te- they tend to do things they wouldn't normally do. So in a, in, so that makes kind of sense to me, but in a therapeutic situation, yep. in, the same thing kind of happens for a while. The conscious part of your mind, the part of you that says I can, or I can't do this is suspended. Yep. And then the operator, the hypnotherapist, can then input what that person wants. And generally, and I like to think so, it's what they want to happen next. So let's say someone comes in to quit smoking and now they're in hypnosis. And Mm -hmm. you say, from today, the need for a cigarette's gone from your mind, gone from your body. You no longer need a cigarette. Then that suggestion is picked up and carried out. And it's, it's so powerful. When we think about... As you know, I, I've, I developed this technique called the arrow technique. The arrow, yeah. For chronic pain. And even though I've been doing that for a long time, maybe 20 years, and I've seen thousands of people and thousands of people around the world because that's a, a product people can buy, if you like, are being helped by that. It still amazes me when someone comes into my office, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Mm-hmm. They come into your office. They've been in pain for years. And I ask the question, is that pain of any use to you? Yeah. You know, if it's long-term, useless, unnecessary pain, as I term it. And then we run one of, you know, your, the Simpson protocol, you run the arrow technique, and they walk out of there without any pain. Mm-hmm. It makes no sense at all that that should happen, and yet it does. And as I said, we were saying earlier, the, um, the client, I yeah. don't care how it works. They just want freedom from their pain. They just want to have the outcome. That's what they want to have. Hmm. So um, I think we'll leave the the topic of the power of love till the next time. We're three minutes till break. So uh, we'll (laughs) we'll finish talking about this. And I think it's a great idea because from my point of view is that they totally always come for the outcome. They don't yeah. care if, you know, I, I, I tell my students, if you're going to make a pre-talk, make it to the person. Don't, you know, they don't really want to know what scalpel you're using and how, what the history is. They don't mm. care. They just want to be helped. And if exactly. they're wanting to be helped, then you can help them. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah, it's exactly right. And as I said, we were going to talk about the power of love, but I've, I've used the word love, but we're really talking about emotion. Mm. And we'll get into it in the next part of this chat we're having together. Yeah, it's, it'll be great. It's just understanding that emotion, love, especially positive emotion. Mm. And we'll talk exactly. about the other side a little bit too, probably. So yeah. understand that we are emotion-driven beings, right? And the thing is that we're all being hypnotized all the time. All the time. And we're going to explain that, what I mean by that in the next section of this. Because... Yeah. For me, if I can create an emotion, and if I ask you to think about your partner, your husband, uh, all I need to do, suddenly see a smile on your face, I have now created an emotion within you. Yes. And in that, in that moment, when, you're, when I spike an emotion, then you're open, or you're mm-hmm. more open to a positive suggestion. Yeah. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the power of love and suggestion. And, you know, it's uh, interesting today, uh, I've already explained to the audience lots of times, but it's going to not, there's always new people on this, uh, on this podcast, on this radio show. So we like to tell everybody everything. And I've already sort of told them about hypnosis and world hypnosis, all kinds of hypnosis. And then they go, yeah, yeah, 
<laughs> but you know, there what really is happening is what well, we're always in hypnosis. We're always in hypnosis. And uh, yeah. I think we've got a few seconds left, but while I was yeah. in India last year and a man said, you're either being hypnotized, you're hypnotizing or you're already hypnotized. Either way, you're in hypnosis. Yes, I agree. I agree with him. And, you know, they're, they have that uh, foundation of very uh, spirituality and all that kind of stuff. And mm. those people are, everyone is in hypnosis. The whole world is in hypnosis. And it's, sometimes it's a negative trance and sometimes it's a positive. So yeah. we should get rid of the, the negative more and more all the time. Yeah, so let's just go to break now, and we'll see you on the other side. Okay. You're listening to Hypnosis Everywhere, The Simpson Protocol. To reach the show today, send an email to Inez, that's I-N-E-S, at InezSimpson.com. Now, back to this week's program. Well, welcome back, everybody, and we're here with Freddie Jacqueline. And we are talking about all kinds of things. So we're just going to talk about power of love, emotions, all kinds of things. Sorry, I'll just lead you in by that and you can just take it from there. <laughs> Thanks. We, we harmonized on when we said the power of love then. Yeah, we, we did. Break into song. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah, we were talking just before the break about how everyone's hypnotized, everyone's in yeah. trance, which... For people listening who, who think, well, no, that's, that can't be true. But, you know, when you understand what hypnosis is and what it's not, you know, for me, as I, I, was, as I was saying just before the break, if I can create an emotion, then I can give you a suggestion that's likely to stick or bite. Mm -hmm. You know, and, so, and it's very easy in a hypnotherapy uh, session, if you like. You know, most of the people I see will come in with, you know, some kind of, behavior that's detrimental to them. They might be smoking, they might be doing drugs, they might be drinking too much alcohol, they may be eating too much. But if I can find, and I'm always looking for what I call levers, emotional levers when people are in. You know, if I ask them to think about their son, they tell me they've got a little boy, you know, and I say, you know, I ask a simple question, if, you, you know, if your child's life depended upon you quitting smoking today, would you quit? You know, and I don't think I've seen 25,000 people for smoking and, I, and no one's ever said, no, I wouldn't quit. But then I'll bring that child into as a lever for the emotion. When I get them into hypnosis and I say, think about your son, think about the love he feels for you, think about the love you feel for him. And with that understanding, with that love, there's nothing you cannot overcome. And as you feel that love, the need for a cigarette has gone from your body and your mind. So I will use that emotion in that situation. But for me to induce hypnosis, you know, take some of what we would call not hypnotized to hypnotized, for me, it's very simple. If I can create an emotion within you, I can give you a suggestion that's going to stick. And I know this is a, a radio, so it's like, uh, it's, it's like showing paintings on the radio. But if you're up for... <laughs> <laughs> if you're up for experiencing something mm -hmm. and you, you know, obviously they can't, people can't see, but you can tell them what your experience is. If you'd okay. like to experience something, let me do, do you want to demonstrate something to sure. you now quickly? Sure. The Go power ahead. of love. Okay. Mm -hmm. Power of love. Just do this for me. And so you can do this, your eyes yeah. open. Yep. Place your arm out in front of you like this, shoulder height. And just look at, look at me and listen to me. And as you listen to me, I want you to just think about Martin. Think about that love of your life. Remember when you first met him? See his face now. Feel that love right now. And as you feel that love, and I want you to notice that arm's hanging all by itself. Imagine there's nothing you can do about it now, Ines. And when you realize there's nothing you can do about it, I want you to try and get it down and find it goes even higher. I do not want you to pretend, Ines. Push even harder, find it goes even higher. Put some effort in. Come on, you're a strong woman. Push even harder, find it goes even higher. But are you hypnotized? Is that even your arm? Pull yeah. even harder, find it goes even higher. Something strange is going to happen. The harder you try and get the arm down, the higher the other one's going to lift. Push even harder. When the other one going up, there it goes. But are you hypnotized? Are you in a trance? Are your eyes closed? Are you relaxed? No. I'm going to click my fingers. No. I'm going to click my fingers. Your hands will drift down. As they drift down, your eyes will close for a split second. And when they open, you'll have a smile on your face and you understand just how loved you are and how fabulous you are. As a woman, as a hypnotherapist, get ready. That's right, arms drifting now, feeling absolutely incredible now. Eyes opening. 
you know, for me, this is not complex anymore. If I can create an emotion within you, and it's very easy because I know you've got a man next to you that you love, um, I can get you to ask, and I can do that in the therapy room asking someone about their child. Mm. I can do that, you know, and yes, we're going to go through the ceremony of hypnosis. You know, we're going to do, because people expect it. But the reality of it is we can influence someone very quickly by spiking emotion. Now, what we were talking about earlier about how we're all hypnotized Let's take this one step further. You imagine that, you know, you've got a, a housewife or a woman. She's there with her kids. She's had a really good day. She's happy. Her husband walks in. He had a very frustrating day. And then he makes her feel bad. He upsets her. So he's, he's spiked an emotion, albeit a negative one. Mm-hmm. And, then he'll, and then if he says, well, you know, but you're rubbish and you're, a, you know, a useless housewife or useless mother, if that happens enough times, then just as in hypnosis, we're going to pick that suggestion up, then that woman's going to start to believe that she is useless, she is a bad mother. Yeah. So, you know, when we understand the power of emotion and suggestion, then we understand that that's going on every day in our lives. Always. All the time. Yeah. And so let's look at this a different way around. As I said, I've been doing this for 30 years or close to 30 years, and I've seen a lot of people. And like most hypnotherapists or most people that work with hypnosis as therapy, I would, I, people would come in, they'd tell me their problem. I would then think I'd hypnotize them, <clears throat> put them into a trance, and then help them overcome that problem. But once we understand that we're already in trance, albeit, most of the time, negative trances, you know, I can't do this, I can't overcome that, I'm afraid of this, I, you know, I can't achieve this. All be a negative trance. When you recognize that the person walks into your therapy room already in trance, then reality is all I have to do is explain they're already in trance. They always could have quit smoking if they wanted to. They just that the propaganda and the mass hypnosis is you're addicted and you can't quit and it's going to be yeah. difficult. Once you rec- once they recognize they're already in, in a trance they've been placed in, I can quite easily, and I've done it a lot of times now, I will hypnotize the person. I'll say, I'm going to hypnotize you. And at some point I'm going to count to three. And you are going to come out of that 20 year, I can't quit smoking trance. And I'm going to leave you in a positive Freddy trance. <laughs> where, of course I like you that. Can. A Freddy trance is good. Oh, yeah. Freddy <laughs> trance. Where you, of course, you can live your life without a cigarette. You know, they come in with this. Um, you know, I see people weight loss. You know, uh, it's, it's quite, you know, uh, a lot of people go to hypnotherapists for weight loss. And once you recognize they're just in a, I can't stop eating cake trance, or I can't stop, <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop snacking trance. You know, and then you explain that to them. You know, at some point in their life, someone said to them, you've got to finish everything on your plate. If you're a child and you're upset and you're already full and you don't like your Brussels sprouts and and a parent, you're already in an emotional state. The parent says, you know, there are children that are starving in the world, like my dad said to me. (laughs) You must finish everything on your plate. Of course, that's a suggestion in an emotional state so from then on you know whatever's put in front of you you're going to eat you know and it's just the way it is and it's one of the biggest problems on our especially in the western world yeah where in the british culture it's our culture to eat everything that's put in front of us you know so once a person recognizes that they are allowed to leave some food and you give them permission to do that, or they give themselves permission to leave some food on their plate. And I hypnotize them and say, I'm gonna, you're going to pop out of that, I can't leave food on my plate trance, and I'm going to leave you in a Freddy trance, trance, which says, I can stop eating when I've eaten enough <laughs> yeah. trance. So some of this is not complex. When we recognize, and I'd ask everyone that's listening to this, to think about the limitations they have, the limiting beliefs they have about what they can and cannot do. And then ask yourself, is that just a hypnotic trance that I was placed in? Is that really true? Or is it just a belief that was placed on me? 
Because when they recognize that it is just a limiting belief or a hypnotic trance that someone put them in, they can say, you know, I choose to believe something else. Yep. I choose to believe that I can do this. Choice is everything, so, isn't it? Yeah. If it's an irrational fear, and that most people understand what a difference between a, a natural concern is and an, and an irrational fear. You know, to have a, a fear of spiders in Canada or America or Australia, where they have bird-eating spiders, you might, it's kind of a natural awareness you need to have. But being afraid of spiders in the UK is pretty pathetic. <laughs> because there isn't anything over here that can possibly hurt you. And yet people panic. You know, yeah. so when a person understands the difference between what I call a natural concern and an irrational fear, yeah. and then look at it again and think, well, was that, was that placed on me? Because the truth of the matter is, people don't come into the world, you know, I don't think they do anyway, naturally afraid of spiders. I remember when I've got four sons and they range from um, 48 to 17. You know, it's the power of hypnosis. But anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's the um, power of love, I think. <laughs> but, you know, when my 17-year-old, you know, when he was a baby, crawl, still crawling, a spider went, went across the room. Well, because all the adults in the room went, whoa, we've got a big spider. And they all jumped and stood on chairs and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> And I just thought, you know, I'm not going to let this baby be afraid of these things. And even though it was not really, it went against my natural instincts to pick this spider up. You know, I got on my hands and knees with him. My, my, his older brother was two years older, maybe two and a half or three years old. He got on my back and we crawled after this spider together. And then I picked it up gently. I opened my hand. I got both of them to touch it, show it wasn't anything to be scared of. And then we let it go outside. But, you know, but it, had I panicked and had they watched everyone else panicking, yeah. then they're going to go, well, I'm a child, they're an adult, that must be scary. Yeah. And then I'd have been afraid of it. But most of our fears start with our imagination. Yep. Most of those, you know. Just imagine many, the little pictures on it or whatever. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. see it in the worst case, worst case scenario, yeah. Yeah. But... Most of our fears and most of our limitations were placed on us, probably by, you know, well-meaning parents or teachers. But what I say to my clients now is whatever their limitations were, what their, the voice in their head that's going, you know, you can't do this or you're never going to do that or you're not any good at this, <laughs> that kind of imposter monster, as I think Laurie Hammond calls it, once we recognize the voice, and it's probably not ours, and then we recognize that it was only ever someone's opinion. It was never really true. But because, you know, they might be someone we admire or someone that we look up to, then we're going to take their opinion and we hold it as truth. And so I'm going to ask everyone that's listening to this to start to just question their limitations and ask whether it's real. And if it's not, then go, okay. And I'm sure you've run these for two years now. A lot of the people out there can do their own self-hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And if they can't, it's very simple. Just sit in a chair and repeat the word relax four times in your mind. You'll go into a nice light trance and then just count yourself out of the negative trance you've been in and just see what happens. You know, for me... <laughs> Well, I hope they pick that one up and keep it. Well, why not? Just say, yeah. okay, well, I've got a limitation here and I'm not doing what I want to do. I'm going to take myself into hypnosis and I'm just going to do what Freddie suggested and count to three. And on three, I'm going to suggest to my unconscious mind that I come out of that negative trance and I'm going to stay in a positive trance. Because let's be honest, none of this exists outside of our skull. <laughs> yeah none of it you know it, we can look at all of the therapies the talking therapies and none of those things exist outside the skull and what i've been saying to clients for a long time now is that once we understand this that nothing exists outside of our skull except as perception even pain you know we might be experiencing terrible pain in our knee but that's not where it's registering mm -hmm. if you had if you were to break your neck it wouldn't matter what you did to your knee. 
You could <laughs> cut your could cut your leg off. <laughs> yeah. Not not suggesting you do that. No, no. <laughs> not in, not in <laughs> Don't try that at home. <laughs> but you know. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, you know, but then we realize that the pain we're experiencing only exists in our skull. True. It registers in our brain. And most, a lot of pain, acute pain has a purpose. But most of us, the pain we're suffering, especially when you get to my age, you know, is, is chronic pain. It's of no use to us. It's long-term chronic pain. And once your brain accepts that, and you can do through hypnosis, we, it's almost like I... Because I think it's just giving the person permission to go, if it's useless and unnecessary, I can ignore it. And what our brain does that. With the arrow technique from, that I run for chronic pain, people, people have asked, come from all over the world and said to me, Freddie, how does this work? I'm using it with my clients, I'm using it with my patients, how does it work? And I only have a theory, and like the Freddie trance, it's a Freddie theory. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's no more real than that it is a freddy theory um but you know they are but we all know that under certain circumstances if our life is is under immediate threat then we feel no pain you know i have i have women come in and they've got young children and they've been in chronic pain for years and i say look, if your child was about to step on the street in front of the traffic where would your pain be and they say, I, haven't got, I wouldn't have any pain. So in that moment of understanding and realization, they do realize there is a place they can get to naturally <clears throat> where they can ignore the pain. And so, I don't know, I think, I'm sure you've studied Ericsson or you've read Ericsson. You know, from my mind, he is the genius of hypnotherapy. He was a anyway. genius, total genius. Yeah, he is a genius. And he's one of those people that are placed every now and again, we get him on the planet that step, step humankind forward uh, by a hundred years. And I, I believe he was that man. And I read about his, this is a story of Ericsson's and where he went into a hospital, whether this is true or myth, I don't know, because you know, people talk about Ericsson, there's lots of myth around him, whether he actually did half the things they say he did. But anyway, he was in this hospital and this woman was in pain. She was dying. She was, you know, she didn't have much longer to live and she didn't want to be on any more morphine she wanted to be able to communicate with her family for the last few months of her life. But she was in terrible, you know, uh, agonizing pain. So he just walked in and he looked at her in his bed and he said, if a Bengal tiger burst through that door, where would your pain be? And she just looked at him and she said, I wouldn't have any pain. And then for the next three months of her life, wherever long she lived for, if anyone asked where her pain was, she would say, I haven't got any pain. I've got a Bengal tiger under my bed. She managed, <laughs> she just managed to hold on to that understanding yeah. that she could free herself from the pain. And I believe, I believe that is all that's happening. You know, we know about people in war zones where they can get terrible injuries and carry on fighting. And the, one of the, have we got some time left? It's done, is it? Yeah. It's okay, done. Sorry. We'll go to break now. Okay. okay. We'll just go to break and we'll see you on the other side with the Bengal Tiger. All right. Great. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Back to this week's program. Welcome back, everybody. And we're having a great time with Freddie Trance and <laughs> Freddie Theories. And I'm stealing it. I love it. So here he is. Freddie. Jack. Thanks. Well, we were talking about Bengal tigers just before the break. <laughs> and um, no, but I think it, it so, sort of leads into the way I think about all the work I do with hypnosis. You know, I, I, I ran a course in back in the, uh, 2006 for training parents how to use some of these simple hypnotic mm. techniques um, for their children. Yeah. And, but the, the, back in the 2006, it may be better now, you know, the word hypnosis and children, people went, well, you know, no, not hypnotizing kids. You know, that's not going to happen. Um, but I, so I changed it because I do believe this is what hypnosis is. It's a natural heightened learning state. When we're in hypnosis, we can learn things very rapidly. We can take on board ideas very rapidly and suggestions very rapidly. And 
I train people all over the world. We train on five different continents now, my son and I, uh, all around the world, like you, Australia, New Zealand, you know. Um, yeah. And wherever we go, it's the same question. What is hypnosis? But people say, how can you train someone in five days to then go out and help people overcome fears, alcohol problems, drug problems in five days? How can that possibly happen? How could they possibly know enough to go and do that? The reason I believe it's possible, and I know it's possible because we train thousands of people who are doing that, is because we start with the assumption that the only person in the therapy room that has the answer to the problem and the resources to overcome it is the person in the therapy chair, not in my chair. Yeah. So it's a very simple and clean way of working. I don't need to know what the problem is. You know, most people are going to tell me but the truth is, I really don't know. I don't need to know. I, I want to know their outcome, how they want to feel afterwards. <laughs> but I'm not really interested in, I am interested, but I, it doesn't matter to me because all I have to do as a hypnotherapist is get my client's conscious mind out of the way for a while. So their unconscious mind goes, okay, Freddie, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and I'm just going to feed back what my client said. And and so the unconscious mind, for that period of time, it's open to doing that. Yeah. The conscious mind, which is the part of us that thinks it is us, in, in reality is the least dependable part of our being. The conscious mind can only hold seven plus or minus two things at the same time. You know, that's why we remember our phone numbers in chunks. You know, 0751 now you've all got my phone number, but you know, it's, um, it's in chunks. So try and remember those numbers in a line would be difficult. So we chunk it down, but our unconscious mind, while you're thinking about what dress you're going to wear, it's taking care of your blood pressure. It's monitoring the environment. I think that might be dangerous. It's keeping your heart beating properly. It's doing all of those things in milliseconds. And from the moment you draw breath when you are born to the moment you have your last breath, your unconscious mind is never off. It never switches off. It's your unconscious mind that will smell smoke in the house in the night while you're fast asleep, while your conscious mind's fast asleep. It's your unconscious mind that hear the creak on the stairs that shouldn't be there while you're fast asleep. It's always from the moment you're born to the moment you die is monitoring the environment. It wants you to keep you safe. So for me now as a therapist, it's become very simple. I believe, and again, it's just a Freddy theory for what it's worth. <laughs> that your unconscious mind is only ever trying to do one of two things. It's trying to protect you or it's trying to give you pleasure. So when a client comes in and they're talking about their problem, all I have to really ask myself, is this pleasure or is it protection? And in the majority of cases, I'm sure you'll agree, their problem is one of protection. Yep. The unconscious mind trying to protect them. Sometimes it's doing too good a job. It's stopping them from achieving what they want to achieve. Yep. And so that's all I have to figure out, really. And then I get their own unconscious mind to make the changes at a molecular cellular level, if you like. And that's why also we can affect the physical body with hypnosis. Yes. We cannot not affect our body with our thoughts. You know, if you're feeling a little bit depressed and someone's out there, I'm not saying if they're on depression pills and they got chemical depression, but if you're feeling a little bit down, a little bit depressed, just put a smile on your face for 10 minutes. Uh, if nothing else, it will really annoy your neighbours by walking around. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you can't smile and continue to feel depressed. You can't exercise and feel depressed because the chemistry in your brain changes when you're smiling. That's right. Uh, Ericsson, getting back to Ericsson, I'm going to tell another story of this as we're talking about depression. Okay. <laughs> but he had a client came to see him once and this guy was depressed. And so he, Ericsson used to give his clients tasks, homework to do. And he said to this guy, he said, I want you, for the next week, till you come back to see me, I want you to get a notepad, a drawing pad, and I want you to go into the city, and I want you to draw all of the weather mains on top of the buildings. You know, you've got these cockerels, and you've got, 
you know the things that the yeah. weather means the wind yeah. thing he said yeah. let's go and you've got to walk around the city for a week and you i want you to bring me back a sketch of all of these weather mains anyway the guy comes back a week later and he said uh, he said did you do the homework he said yes so he said show me your pad so he's got the pad he said and where's the depression been and the guy realized he hadn't been depressed for a week one he had a purpose which is important for all of us we need a yeah. purpose and he also changed his body posture he spent a week looking up, up, up. <laughs> instead of looking down and just by changing his posture and having a purpose in life he it, 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 uh, forgotten about depression so i'm saying to everyone out there we can change the way we feel by our body posture we can stand taller we can smile we can laugh you know um you know laugh out loud as i said don't do it at the bus stop because it does get a bit dangerous <laughs> But <laughs> we, yeah. and getting back to the power of love, you know, and by changing our emotional state, we can change the way we feel. Yeah. Our own self talk is important in this situation. Once we understand the power of love, the power of emotion, let, you know, put a smile on your face and give yourself a positive suggestion, and you'll find your life changing. And, and you can um, do that for the people around you as well. Recognize when they're in a good state and give them a positive suggestion. You don't have to be a hypnotherapist to do this. No. We're doing it anyway. As the guy in India said to me, we're either hypnotized, hypnotizing, or being hypnotized. Yes. Either way, we're in trance. You know, I've got a, I, a, a small story from the show. Reverend Timothy Jones was on, and he was talking about being cut off in Toronto. Uh, you might have met him, I don't know, when you were there, but he was in there and they were, they were doing the finger and, you know, uh, and he yelled out, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and he did that about four times on the way to where he was going. And by the time he came in, he was like, mm, beaming, you know, and that's the changing the level. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and we, we all have the ability to do it. Yeah. We have a choice, as you were saying earlier. Yeah. You know, and... I remember I saw a client who was depressed. His father had died, his father-in-law had died, and he, he cared for both those men. And I was talking about choice in, you know, and he said, well, I'm just, I'm depressed. And I said, well, okay. He, so I said, well, what if you were to choose to be happy? Just try it for a week, try it on for a week. You know, pretend to be happy for a week, see what happens. And he said, <laughs> he said, my auntie, he said, he said, reminded me of something. He said, my auntie, who I loved, he said, when I was a kid, she was my favorite aunt. She was always fun, always jovial. You know, always a good time. He said, and she got married and she fell in love with this man and she loved him and they were really banging in love with each other. And then unfortunately he passed away. He said, and I saw her and she was obviously sad and depressed. And I'd never seen her like it in my life. He said, and she was like that for a few months. And then I didn't see her for a while and I saw her again and she was back to her jovial self. And he said, and I asked her, you know, what happened? She said, well, I woke up one morning and I just decided I was going to be happy again. And she was. Yeah. What if we could just decide, and I believe we can, how we want to feel. If we look at our behavior, our, some of our bad behaviors, and go, that doesn't suit me anymore. I just choose to behave in a different way. We don't have to be stuck in these states. No, that's my feelings. We, as a hypnotherapist, the only person in my room that has the answer to the problem and has the strength to resolve it is the person in the therapy chair. All I have to do is get them out of their own way. But what if we could all do that? Recognize that we're just, this is just a, a, a behavior. It's not, it's not real. It doesn't exist outside of my skull. You know, it doesn't. None of this stuff, even all of our emotions. Look at the emotions that are, uh, are in my book, Hypnotherapy, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Uh, I run a, a technique called TPM, Total Perception Manage, Management. And where you can just choose what emotion you want with a click of your fingers, ramp up a, a good emotion and annihilate a, a negative emotion that can be done. So I hope people have got something from my jabbering today. I think it was a great show so far and we have a few minutes. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that book a little more and how to get it, etc. Okay. And well, the maybe... book's called the book's called hypnotherapy. Um, 
Methods, techno Techniques and Philosophies of Freddie H. Jackwin. You get it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of Freddie theories in there. Yeah. And uh, you can get it as an Audible book as well. Oh. And that's selling all around the world. It is the best best selling hypnotherapy book i believe on hip on amazon at the moment um so that's good and you can get it as an audible my son and i uh jack and hypnosis academy we've now got online training so you can go there as a membership it's very cheap it's 47 dollars, and you can learn everything he's put everything i've ever done on there i've said to him why do you want to do that for 47 dollars he said i promise <laughs> it'll be all right he's given everything away but you can go and join the jack Quinn hypnosis academy.com Look for my online training. You can binge watch while we're in lockdown all of my stuff um, from Las Vegas all around the world. So, yeah, there's, there's that. And it's freddyjackquin.com. If you want to work with me one-to-one -one online or if you want to speak to me online, you can do that. So, yeah, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Quite okay. literally, a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> it's very awesome. So, uh, anyway, I think that was great and you you're very succinct and articulate in the simplicity of hypnosis thank you well yeah. i love it as you know and i'm yeah. passionate about it yeah and i'm fascinated i hope people who are listening to this also get fascinated by it and use it for themselves it's a beautiful yep. tool it's, i you're sort of uh singing to the choir here because i totally am on the same side as you and i've been promoting self-hypnosis for a long time and self-choice so um yeah. you really played right into my hands which was perfectly done and i really appreciate it i appreciate you can learn that you can learn self-hypnosis from my book if you want especially on the audible you can you can experience it so hypnotherapy amazon audible sounds good to me and it's so, so nice to speak to you again Ines. it's been great and, uh, it's hopefully i'll great. meet you in the world somewhere soon when we're out of lockdown <laughs> well hopefully i'll be in the uk when things start moving again and that'd i'll be, be there so that'd be great and i'll get to see you and kaz riley and bob burns and everybody that's all been on the show and having yeah, a great time suspects with yeah the usual suspects <laughs> beryl comar except she hides in 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 spain yeah what a, what how terrible you locked down in spain that's terrible for her well no because she came from dubai it's terrible to be yeah now where she is she's feeling better yeah, now she's one, she's she's one of my favorite people on the planet as is kaz <laughs> riley as is bob burns as is you you know so we've got some fabulous people we get to meet yeah that's the other joy of hypnosis that we get to meet some fabulous people and that's the bent that yeah, i hope the listeners the have hope the, hope the listeners have enjoyed this little chat anyway and and I, think I wish so. them all the best. Stay well. Be safe. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see you next time.